So last but least, although not in terms of mass, uh, I thought what I'd do is talk about two things this morning. First, a train wreck I see coming, and second, the largest of all of the ohms and omics. So here's the train wreck. I've been teaching health law since about 1985, and ever since I started teaching health law, the electronic medical record has been five years away. 1985 is going to be here in 1990, 1995 is going to be here in 2000, 2005 is going to be here in 2010. It's actually here, pretty much. They're not perfect. They don't speak to each other very much, very well. EPIC turns out not to be a language, but more a language family. It's like Indo-European, so it can be everything from Persian to Italian to Gaelic. But there are electronic health records. More surprisingly and more quickly, Genomic data has appeared. It really is quite shocking to remember that it was only in 2003 that allegedly the first full human genome sequence, not exactly a full human genome sequence, but you know, pretty close, was completed for a price tag of somewhere around half a billion dollars. Since accounting is the darkest of all the dark arts, it might have been 50 million, it might have been 3 billion, but it was a lot of money. Now you could get a human genome sequence for about 2,000, 3,000. If you're a special friend of Rick, you can get it for about $1,000. The price has come down enormously, much more quickly, I think, than most of us expected. So now we have a situation where we are beginning to see clinical use of sequence data, as well, of course, as SNP data, exome data, et cetera. But genomic data is getting into patient medical records. Right now, it's not getting into a lot of patient medical records. It's mainly getting into the records of people with cancers, where it's the cancer sequence, which, of course, includes some of, started with and includes some of their own sequence, and it's children and their parents and diagnostic odysseys. But clearly, I think, whether it is justified or not, we will see more and more clinical use of sequencing and more and more sequence data in electronic health records. And that's where I see the train wreck coming. One train on one track is the researcher's understandable, justifiable, and moral desire to get more data, to get more information, to get sequence data that they can correlate with phenotypic health record data in order to not just get tenure, get the next grant, win the Nobel Prize, but also to relieve human suffering. But the train in the other direction, on the same track, is the fact that this data isn't from research subjects. It's from patients. It's from people who didn't sign up to be subjects, people who have that data there because they were sick. And they went to see their doctor. You know, the way Bernie was talking about, you give up some privacy, you do some things with not meaningful consent, like your latest iPhone update, or your latest iTunes update, because you get something back from it. We go to the doctor because we hope to get something useful back from it. So we'll have patient data that researchers will find irresistible. One linguistic tautology is that things that are truly irresistible will not be resisted. And as a result, I think that there will be incredible pressure to get access to clinical data that has genomic sequence information in it. I look around here in Northern California, and I think of the Kaiser Permanente system. 3.2 million members or so, actually a pretty good electronic health record, increasing interest in genomics. In 10 years, there'll be what? Half a million, a million, a million and a half of those 3.2 million people will have significant genomic data in that database, easily accessible. How many of you who are researchers would like to get access to that? And the rest of you are either not researchers or I think not telling the truth. <laughs> I think it's going to be irresistible. And the same will be true, of course, of other systems that have similarly broad amounts of data. But as patients, how would you feel knowing that your information was going to be used for research, but not really knowing anything else about it. Should we consent 
each of those 3.2 million people. If we did, that's a lot of time. It's a lot of money and effort to do that consent that could otherwise be spent for research. It's also the case that some people will say no. People in doing surveys find generally that about 80 or 90 percent of people are willing to participate in research if it's, if it's sort of uh, records research and doesn't require nasty things to be done to their bodies. But that means that 10 to 20 percent of people won't, wouldn't consent. What happens if they don't consent? Legally, they may not have to consent under today's legal regime because if it is de-identified data, it doesn't count as human subjects research. There may be some HIPAA issues that would need to be thought about very carefully, at least in the United States. And, and I have to apologize, particularly after hearing Jane's excellent presentation about my very parochial standpoint. I'm only talking about the United States because it's the only place I know anything at all about. Um, but I think the, the legal setting there is tricky. The patient's expectations, though, are going to be varied. Some will be happy to participate in research. And I think one can make a good argument that they all should be happy to participate in research. That we should all think of participation in biomedical research as a duty of citizenship, as a duty of belonging to the human species and wanting to take advantage of health. And I think that's actually a pretty good argument. But I also think it's not something that most people believe, at least in the United States. Scandinavia may be a little bit different, but the United States people don't think that they have a duty to be research subjects. And what worries me, and part of this is ethics, and part of this is law, and part of this is politics, frankly, what happens when people find out that something is being done with their health data that they didn't know about and they're not sure they like? They get upset. The Havasupai who you've probably heard about, small tribe, lives in the Grand Canyon, thought it was participating in research for diabetes. One of the tribal members was at, a, was at Arizona State, sat in on an um, oral dissertation defense, and discovered that their data was being used not just for diabetes, but for research in the genetics of schizophrenia, and research in the location of their ancestral origin which really bothered them because their view was they knew where they had been created. They'd been created in that canyon in the Grand Canyon. And they didn't want any outsiders telling them differently. It's going to be a cold day in the Grand Canyon before the Havasupai participate in research again, in genetic research again. The Navajo, their much bigger neighbors, have had a moratorium on genetic research for 15 years. People who expectations are upset, who get surprises, especially about things they care about, like health data, whether they should or not. I would rather give you my health records than give you my credit card records. My health records will tell you, and I'm, you know, be calm, that my doctors think I should lose weight. <laughs> and my blood pressure is a little higher than it should be. And nothing very exciting in my health records. But there are exciting things in some people's records, and whether they're exciting things or not, in this culture, people believe that they are secret, believe that they are important, more so than they actually are, either secret or important. And overturning those expectations is going to be a problem. So I would rather see these two trains pass each other than collide. But I am very worried that unless we pay more attention to it, the insatiable desire for more data and data that is collected that includes both genotypic data and phenotypic data, clinical research records on individuals, is going to lead to a really ugly collision with patients' rights, patients' interests that could have strong negative political ramifications for all of research. And that's important because if people don't like research, they don't vote for research, they don't vote for uh, legislators who support research, they don't participate in research, they don't like researchers, and the world, I think, is a worse place. Second point, the biggest of the omics. We know about genomics, we know about metabolomics, we know about um, methylomics, we know about narcissomics, we know about all sorts of omics. The biggest of all of the omics is hypomics. The amount of hype in our society generally, 
and particularly around biomedical advances, is enormous. Enormous, and it seems to be growing. I understand this. Unfortunately, our society runs on hype. People are told, young men are told, that if only they drink the, the right light beer, beautiful women will throw themselves all over them. Advertising is hype. Everybody plays the game. And hype, to some extent, is in everybody's interests. It is not just the bad editors at rotten newspapers or websites who do it. It is, among other things, public relations, communications offices at major medical schools that announce week after week breakthroughs. If one in 50 of those breakthroughs actually leads to an improvement, directly to an improvement in human health, we'll be very, very lucky. But there's a breakthrough a week from every major medical school in the United States. Because in order to get attention in a society that's saturated with hype, the reaction is to hype even more. Hype is another bad idea in the long run. It has short-term benefits of getting attention. It has long-term benefits that maybe people will remember what you've said and look at what resulted. Already, with precision medicine, I have seen people dredge up quotes from Francis Collins from 15 and 20 years ago about how spectacularly successful genetics was going to be in curing the world's ills and comparing them with his quotes now about how spectacularly successful it will be in curing the world's ills, and comparing the two and saying, looks the same as 15 years ago. I'm carrying this not just because I think it's stylish. Eight weeks ago, I got a new hip. I'm now bionic, titanium. I actually think genomic research is going to be a good thing. I think it will relieve lots of human suffering. If we're lucky, it may relieve as much human suffering as hip replacement surgery which 420,000 Americans will have this year, and which is a wonderful thing. But we need to keep it into context, not overpromise, in the way that we have overpromised regularly in the past. It's a narrow line because if you don't overpromise, you don't get any attention paid to you. But if you do overpromise, you're running up a tab that eventually will have to be paid. When people say, you promised this, you delivered that and I worry that we're running up too big a bill and that we're not going to be able to repay it. Thank you. Um.